Hi guys, this is Jen. In this video, I'm going to give you guys three of my top tips to tackle any unseen poetry analysis tasks or exams. This is going to be super helpful for any of your unseen analysis tasks, so make sure that you watch till the very end of the video to get all of the good stuff in your revision toolkit. to start unpacking any poem is to actually look for repetition. Repeated words, repeated sounds, repeated sentence structures, repeated stanzaic patterns, repeated ideas, what have you. So the first question to ask yourself when coming in cold with a poem is this. Can I spot any repeated words, lines, sounds or patterns? And once you do that, go ahead and sketch a quick table and fill it in with the quotations and observations that contain all of these repeated references. Now, assuming that you're familiar with your literary and technical terms, which you should be by the time you're doing an exam, you should be able to identify these terms from the quotations and observations you've just recorded. So for example, repeated words or groups of words could be examples of motif or imagery. Repeated sentence structure could be examples of anaphora, epistrophe or parallelism. Repeated lines could be refrains. Repeated sounds could be alliteration, assonance or rhyme. And repeated patterns could be examples of a certain rhyme scheme or prosodic form. So for example, the tersa rima is made up of regular tercets, which are three line stanzas, while Shakespearean sonnets always end with rhyming couplets. Now there are two reasons to start our unseen analysis by identifying repetition. So first, by identifying similarities across a poem, we're naturally led to identify their corresponding stylistic, structural or sonic devices. And this puts us firmly in an analytical as opposed to a descriptive mindset whenever we're approaching a poem. Now this helps us prevent a common pitfall when it comes to poetry analysis or textual analysis in general. And that is simply summarizing or describing what's happening in the poem or text. Now secondly, when you think about it, no poet is going to repeat something that isn't important to the message. This means that anything which recurs in a text is bound to be significant and worth commenting on because it'll always contribute meaningfully to the broader ideas and themes of that very same text. So this helps direct our attention towards the right things. Now my second tip is to look for anomalies i.e. places that stick out or seem odd when you first read the text because it is precisely in anomalies where tension appears. So for example, if you see that one of the stances in the poem is one line shorter than all the other ones, or if there's a sudden lapse in the rhyme scheme at one point, or if the speaker's voice changes from the first person I to the second person you, there's probably a goldmine of interpretative possibilities for you to discover. Because just as poets don't repeat things that aren't important, so they wouldn't diverge from the norm if there's not a need to convey some sort of shift in idea or tone or simply to make a different point. Usually this appearance of a sudden dramatic change marks some sort of pivot in the poem's narrative or thematic arc, which gives rise to contrast and irony, thereby opening up new layers for our analysis. Now a good example to show how spotting anomalies is key to interpretation would be the rhyming couplet at the end of a Shakespearean sonnet. Now for the first 12 lines in the 14 lines of a Shakespearean sonnet, they follow an alternate rhyme scheme of A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F. But in the final two lines, we notice that the pattern switches to a pair of end rhyme or what we call a rhyming couplet. This structural shift, of course, always signals a thematic twist or revelation in the sonnet which shows that changes in technique or form are often critical to helping us unveiling new avenues of meaning in poetry. And just as we've jotted notes on repetition in the first table, let's go ahead and sketch another table for the anomalies like this.
Okay, with tip three, some of you are gonna groan, but hear me out because this is so, so important. And it is the key to scoring top grades in any poetry analysis. And that's to scan the poem's meter and rhythm. I know it's hard, I know it's onerous, and it's certainly not something we want to do when we're racing against time and super nervous in an exam, which is really why it's helpful to prepare the scansion before you even set foot in the exam hall. Now, scansion is so important because, frankly, it is the essence of poetry. Poems are more than just blobs of words. They're semantic and sonic experiences, texts which are meant to be read and heard. And this is why we really shouldn't ignore meter and rhythm in any poetry analysis, because they are the fundamentals of a poem's soundscape. Now, in technical terms, scansion is composed of rhythmic units and metrical feet. Rhythmic units are your iams, trochees, dactyls, anapests, ampibracts, etc. Whereas your metrical feet would be the manometer, dimeter, trimeter, tetrameter, pentameter, etc. But in layman terms, rhythm is really just syllables and stresses variously placed in a line. So despite the big scary jargon, thinking about rhythm really just boils down to a couple of rather simple intuitive questions. How do the words sound when they roll off your tongue? When do you exert or withhold force when reading out each line? What organic impression does reading the poem create for you that you can also somehow relate to the overall theme or idea of the poem? For instance, if a poem begins with a string of strong trochaic words only to end with iams, then is the poet perhaps trying to convey an ebbing of force or some sort of return to a more natural, if not quieter, state? Or if, in a predominantly iambic poem, there's one specific line that features a waltzy, anapestic rhythm, does that line portray a heightening of emotions, or is it describing some sort of synchronized movement like dancing? So you'll see then that by paying attention to the ebb and flow of syllables and stresses in each line, we can glean a lot of insight into the poem's thematic messages, which of course is what we're always going to need for a great comprehensive analysis. Now, if you guys want to see how I put these tips into practice with an unseen poem task, head over to my blog post on how to analyze any unseen poem, which I'll link to in the description box below. There you'll find a detailed walkthrough of how I tackle a past paper unseen poetry task. Otherwise, thank you so much as always for watching and I really hope that this helped. Make sure to also like this video if you enjoyed it and to subscribe to my channel for useful English lit study resources down the line. I'll see you guys next time. Bye!